interesting. So pumpkins are orange. Oh, hey, sorry. I didn't see you there. I'm just doing a little bit of research on eukaryotic organisms. You see, up until this point, we've mostly been talking about prokaryotes. Last week, we uh, learned about archaea. Before that, bacteria. But this week, we're going back through geologic time to experience one of the most significant transitions in evolutionary history. The transition from single-celled prokaryotes to single-celled and multicellular eukaryotes. It's a weird and beautiful story, but before we get into it, we have to get a bit more familiar with prokaryotic cell structure. So, let's go back to high school science class real quick. Okay, so we're gonna start from the outside of an archaeal or bacterial cell and work our way in. So this is the cell membrane. It regulates the flow of substances in and out of the cell. It's found in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells though, we have this little cluster of genetic material called the nucleoid region and these little guys are ribosomes, which are uh, like little protein factories that help synthesize proteins and a few other things. There are a few other structures within the cell, like the cell wall, which gives it its shape and protects it from the outside world. Also flagella to help with movement. But for our purposes, the most important thing to remember is that the nucleoid and the ribosomes are found in all prokaryotic cells suspended in a gel-like material called cytoplasm. So that's all that empty space here is cytoplasm. Prokaryotic cells are small, simple, and efficient. It's a successful way to live, which is why the bacteria and the archaea had the entire globe to themselves for one and a half billion years. But roughly two billion years ago, one of these prokaryotes, more specifically a branch of the archaea, folded its cell membrane in on itself. Oh man, this is such a bad drawing. Okay. It folded its cell membrane in on itself and created a couple of new structures that allowed it to grow larger and more complex. One of these structures was the endoplasmic reticulum, which helps the cell by synthesizing and transporting proteins around. Those ribosomes are still there, by the way. I just forgot to draw them again. Let me put them in. That looks exactly like a cell in every way. It doesn't look like a not cell at all. The other one is the nuclear envelope, which is a membrane separating the genetic material from the other parts of the cell and forming the nucleus. This membrane-bound nucleus is the textbook difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, but we are just getting to the good part. This new type of archaea was a heterotroph, meaning that it relied on ingesting or absorbing organic substances to create energy. This is nothing new. A lot of prokaryotes have to eat other prokaryotes in order to survive. But what happened next was kind of unique. Our new big boy archaea with its fancy new nucleus engulfed a type of small bacteria called a proteobacteria. But instead of getting digested, this proteobacteria stayed intact within its new host and formed what's called an endosymbiotic relationship. The archaea provided the bacteria with a safe place to hang out and receive nutrients, and in return, the bacteria generated energy that could be used by the archaea. As the archaea reproduced, it passed on its bacterial buddy down to future generations until they became dependent on one another for survival. The bacteria evolved within its new archaea lineage until it was no longer a bacteria, it was a permanent structure within the archaea that we call the mitochondria. And the archaea was no longer an archaea. It was the first true eukaryotic organism. This new organism was the ancestor of all modern day animals, fungi, and some protists. But some of these new eukaryotes decided that endosymbiosis was so much fun, they wanted to do it again. This time with a type of cyanobacteria that could take in sunlight and turn it into energy for its host. This little photosynthetic bacteria became right at home next to its mitochondrial friend, and we now call it a chloroplast. This allowed some eukaryotic cells to undergo photosynthesis and eventually evolve into plant cells as well as some protists. So first eukaryotic cells, all had mitochondria, all had a nuclei. These were the first eukaryotic cells. All of them had a nucleus, all of them had mitochondria, some of them had chloroplasts, and they were all 
amazing and incredible. We have now arrived at the domain Eukarya. If you think this story sounds a little bit too weird to be true, you're not alone. When biologist Lynn Margulis first proposed this theory to the scientific community in 1970, she was met with a lot of skepticism. But as time went on, evidence mounted, and now the theory of endosymbiosis is one of the cornerstones of modern evolutionary biology. The most convincing piece of evidence to support the theory of endosymbiosis is the fact that both the mitochondria and the chloroplasts contain separate DNA from the nucleus. This indicates that both of these organelles were once completely separate organisms with a bacterial heritage. So, where do we go from here? Within the domain Eukarya, we find four separate kingdoms. Plants, animals, fungi, and protists. The three of you can have a seat for a moment, we'll get to you later on, but first, we're gonna check out the earliest and most poorly understood branch of the Eukarya, the protists. Maybe you're not totally familiar with protists, and uh, until I started working on this show, neither was I. But believe me when I say, members of the kingdom Protista paved the way for multicellular life to evolve, diversify, and thrive on this incredible planet. We owe a lot to protists, and we'll give them all the credit they deserve next week. But until then, stay curious, stay connected, and never stop evolving.